Well, hello there, listeners, and hello, Cat. Hello. Welcome to this week's episode of What Do You Know About? Please check in at the front desk to get your room key, and then feel free to join us in the lobby for today's presentation. We promise it'll be worth your stay. I hope that you all caught on for what our topic is this week. Personally, I'm extremely excited about this one, as it is an amazing story that is made up of a variety of smaller stories. I feel like if this is about a hotel, and I know of a couple of, like, spooky history hotels, but I can't think of one that's made up of a couple of stories. Most of them have, like, one big story. Yeah, oh, maybe I, I can think of one. This one has, like... Do you want me to guess? Sure. Is it the Hotel Cecil? No. No? Okay. <laughs> Which no. one are you talking about? <laughs> All right, so some of the women that we talk about today may become episodes of their own, so if anyone catches your ear, please feel free to get in touch with us through our Instagram page to let us know who you want to know more about. But without any more chit-chat, Kat, I want yes. to know, what do you know about the Barbizon Hotel? The Barbizon Hotel. That sounds familiar. It sounds familiar, and I'm... Was that the one where the man and his whole family died? No. Because he had, because he killed himself, and then his wife had all the children jump out of the window because they were in a cult. Mm -mm. Nope, different one. Okay, nope. that is <laughs> not within this hotel's hotels. history. <laughs> oh no! Is that another one that we should talk about another time? Maybe. <laughs> Possibly. I have another hotel that I want to talk about. <laughs> Which one? I'm not telling you. Surprises <laughs> for later episodes. No, I want to know. So. The Barbizon is n isn't just a historical hotel, um, but it still runs today as the Barbizon 63. Um, for a brief stint, it was also known as the Melrose Hotel. Oh, okay. Now, it is technically a condominium and was gutted from the inside, but the building itself is protected under landmark preservation and is on the USA National Historic Record. It's located in New York on the Upper East Side of Manhattan. Okay, so it was built in 1927 to provide housing of a sort for the influx of women who came to New York to work in the newly built skyscrapers. Each and every one of them had to get past Mrs. May Sibley. Sibley was the assistant manager and the number one face that the girls would see at the front desk. She was the one who'd make sure that the new girl was presentable and had good references, attesting to her good moral character. Okay. Um, each girl would then be secretly given a letter code. An A for those under the age of 28, a B for those who were between 28 and 38, or a C for those who were considered to be quote-unquote over the hill at the time. Oh my gosh. So in like eight years, okay. I would be considered over the hill basically oh my word and that's at what like 40 uh so that would be at like 39 i guess would be considered over the hill because it was because the b grade was for those between 28 and 38 39 <laughs> yeah that's okay i feel like there's like a whole demographic of people that they're missing out on doing it that way but i don't know yeah um, so any man who tried to get past the lobby would be laughed at and scolded by Sibley as only women were allowed anywhere past the first floor and like the lobby and even in general of the first floor. Um, a few men claim to be have been up to see the rooms, but is highly unlikely as security and the rules were very strict. Um, this hotel was a safe haven for the naive young women full of dreams in a dangerous big city and nothing was going to make that statement untrue. This is starting to sound more and more familiar. Wait, I think I I think my favorite murder talked about this. They might have. I think I heard about this on my favorite murder. They may. I don't know if they would have talked about it, but they like there's a possibility that they might have talked about it at some point. I I think that's where I remember this from, but it's like. It's like at the edge of my memory where I'm like, I can remember bits and pieces, but I'm not convinced that they're attached to this story. Like I said, there's a lot of haunted hotels. <laughs> yeah, this one's not considered haunted. No? Okay. No, unfortunately. Well, a lot of hotels where, you know, horrific things have happened. It's, oh, yeah. You know, just kind of the way, yeah. the, the way of the business, I suppose. 
So, fairly soon after the hotel was opened, it became public knowledge that those who moved to New York in search of becoming an actress, writer, model, singer, and more should find themselves at the Barbizon rather than any of the many boarding homes or other hotels that sprang up around the same time. Though many did not reach their dreams, the opportunity of meeting one of the few who did was too great to miss. One never knew if there would be a wise tidbit that would ultimately make themselves one of the lucky few. In fact, there is still a group of 14 who are, call, who are just called the women who have stayed on at the Barbizon throughout its many changes and those who are still alive to have their mailboxes next to one of the most famous current residents, Ricky Gervais. Oh, wow. Okay. Yeah. Sadly, the Barbizon Hotel for Women did at first have the use, usual prejudices of the time. Um, So it catered to white, middle-upper-class women with the first known African-American woman not setting foot into the establishment until 1956. It is believed that she was allowed in because of her association with Mademoiselle magazine. The magazine and their Barbizon catered to the same clientele, and all of the guest editors for the magazine would be housed in the hotel for their month-long stays. Interesting. So the, the Barbizon was like, oh yeah, we're totally like we're fine with her coming in but they did forget to mention the pool in the base like in the basement floor of the hotel and stuff like they just forgot to tell her about some of the amenities at the hotel okay like uh, so like plus half a point for doing the bare minimum i suppose but like to call you like to take that as like a stamp of like progress that's very i don't know it feels very super it it feels like tokenism well for sure but i mean it was in the 1950s yeah i guess what else can you expect i guess yeah like it's the 1950s america like so in order to understand the significance of the barbizon hotel we need to understand the quote-unquote new woman this is a term that was popularized by henry james the writer And it really just means a woman who wants independence from the four walls of her home. So the idea started with the Gibson girl, who was basically an upper middle class woman that would almost always look like they were moving forward due to the way that they're dressed. So like how they cinched their waist and stuff, they all, like their body almost always, like like photos and stuff, had like the appearance that they were always in a forward moving position. Fascinating. Okay. Um, World War I came, and so did the new suffragette movement that won women the right to vote. And then when the Barbizon opened in 1928, the Flapper Girl Revolution was in full swing, and women were craving independence more than ever. The Flapper Makes made sense. independence available to everyone, not just those who could afford it, like the Gibson girls and the suffragettes and stuff. Right. Among the first of the residents to move into the Barbizon was a woman who became absolutely famous in 1912. 1912, okay. Margaret Tobin Brown moved into the hotel in 1931 at the age of 63 years old. She was fairly newly divorced from her womanizer husband and unwilling to give up on her activism that ruled her life for a long time. She gave up her activism in order She did to not. Stay like she didn't want to give up her activism so she moved into the Barbizon so that she could sit and write and stuff like that. Gotcha. Okay, Cause that was okay, kind of like the only place that she could be independent. Cause I, at that time you still basically had to have a husband or a father figure to sign off for you to be able to have your own place. So being able to yeah, move into like yeah. one of these hotels that were specifically for women, you could actually right. do that without having a male sign off on it. Yeah. That makes sense. Okay, have you have you figured out who this woman is yet? Like, my okay, my memory is so shit, and there's too many stories that are too similar at this point that my brain is just like, nope, you had two guesses enough. So, okay, so almost anyone who hears about Molly Brown thinks of the Titanic and how she is quote unquote unsinkable. Okay. So, but the unthinkable part is a complete myth, but we'll definitely be doing a podcast episode on her during a series that I want to do on the Titanic itself. Was she on the Titanic? Yes, the unsinkable Molly Brown. So, she was on the Titanic, and she actually 
the men on the boat on like the lifeboat that she was on like weren't rowing quick enough so she took over the oars and stuff like according to legend that's an amazing because she's like you guys aren't like getting us away from the sinking boat quick enough like we're moving <laughs> Hang on, there's a Google search here that just says, how many shipwrecks did Molly Brown survive? Was she in more than one? Is she okay? Legend, legend-wise, no, the there's a lot of myths around her, and it actually kind of started with, like, the musical, um, The Unsinkable Molly Brown, and, like, newspaper headlines, that there's actually a lot of myths around it, which we're gonna go into. Imagine surviving, like, a horrific, culture-changing event, and people write musicals, talking about how you didn't die like and it's so catchy too it just it almost seems like it's like 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 not giving it quite as much weight as it should like she she still almost died like the unsinkable molly brown sounds like a circus act you know what i mean like yeah but and her life itself is just <laughs> insane that people sounds don't like talk it. about because they only talk about <laughs> because they only talk about her surviving the one event yeah interesting okay yeah so it is because of margaret's fame that we are that we are lucky enough to have a good peek into the amenities that the barbizon had for its time one example is found in a letter that she sent a friend where she is absolutely delighted to find that every room has a radio Okay. Class and Price didn't fully have a say in the Barbizon, so Margaret had one of the best rooms, but it was just as modest as the rest with a single bed, small desk, chest of drawers, and an armchair. One could have pair- radi- Sorry, were radios still a brand new thing at the time? They were fairly new, and it wasn't common at that point to have a radio in like every home. But at the Barbizon, like, every single bedroom had a radio that was kind of like in the wall just above the bed that you could- gotcha. Whether- yeah. Like whether it was the cheap room or not. Yeah. Okay. No okay. matter whose room it was, every room was the same. It just that maybe like okay. your location in the hotel was a bit better. That's so hilarious because now when I see a radio in a hotel, I kind of chuckle to myself about it, about it being kind of old fashioned. Yeah, no. That was like a huge <laughs> selling point at that time. Right. Okay. Um, so yeah, so one could apparently literally open and close their door without having to leave the bed, which honestly I'm super here for some days. Wait, how? Like you're so tightly packed and like, like your room is so like was small and tight where it's basically like, yeah, you've got your single bed, your small desk, your chest of drawers and an armchair and stuff, right? But like your bed was in a position enough that you could literally just go to the end of your bed, reach over, close and open, like open and close the door. Oh my gosh. So we're talking like, like, like that's like a, like that's a small room then though, right? Like that's yes. like almost prison cell, prison cell, like not quite prison cell because it's got a little bit more furniture in it, but like it's not that much bigger either then, hey? No. And it's one person to room, right? Correct. Okay. Yeah. I mean, I I guess it's kind of like a tiny home, but like an apartment in a bunch of them, so... Yeah. Interesting. So, Margaret also pointed out a large tower portion of the hotel to her friend in their letters. This tower was built to house various studios for the budding artists that would be spending their time in the housing. For a building that was built during the earlier portion of the 20th century, they made sure that each room had the best soundproofing available and soaring ceilings that would give great acoustics. She also made sure to point out the beautiful library that was available to residents where she participated in a book club. On the lower floor, the Barbizon had shops connected to it. This included a salon, hosiery, dry cleaner, pharmacy, and a double-day bookshop. If they didn't feel like it, residents never had to leave the interior of the Barbizon. So like yeah, each that of, does sound amazing. So like each of these shops had like, like the door that would lead to, into the actual hotel itself, as well as the door that led out to the street. Okay, that that does sound actually kind of amazing. I'm not going to lie. That's starting to sound a little utopic. Right? Utopic? U- utopic? <laughs> so... I don't know how to say that. In the Since the late 1800s, hotel residency was quite common for families and singles. For New York, this was made super easy and possible by the Tenement House Act of 1901. The act made it possible for builders to get around height and fireproofing regulations if housing, 
if housing suites did not have a kitchen in them. Okay, so they don't have to follow fire regulations. And height regulations. And height regulations, which the height one, I'm not quite sure how the kitchen affects. The f not having a kitchen, I can kind of understand some, some of the fire regulations because there's less opportunity for a fire. I can almost understand that logic, but the height, I don't understand the logic. I think because um, with some of the, the regulations at that time, if you built a, a higher than a certain height, if there was a fire, people couldn't, it would be harder for people at the top floors to get out and be more dangerous. Gotcha. Okay. I was thinking of like height regulations to do with like wind uh, resistance against the building and like um, you know, like a uh, earthquake and like that kind of natural disaster. Yeah, I think that like, for, like in relation, it, a to lot the of fire. it was like the like at that point it was like your fireproofing regulations because there'd been a pile of fires um, <laughs> that just swept right. through various parts <laughs> of the U.S. and Canada. Like, if you don't have to build like a pile of the fire escapes, like that you see all of the like like a new york building basically all you know like is like red brick fire escape <laughs> like yeah exactly you don't have to build all of that it makes it cheaper and then you can build higher and prettier that still sounds like a real gamble mm -hmm. like it kind of sounds like the titanic about not having enough lifeboats for everybody kind of all over again yeah you should be preparing for the worst no matter what like Trying to get around that. Yeah, no. So, hotels were built like crazy when this loophole was found. From the more seedy hotels to the most glamorous hotels. The mm. Barbizon is looked at as the most glamorous of the women's hotels, but it wasn't the first. So, basically, okay. you had, like, your sub-genres of hotels, right? So, you had, like, your motels where you're kind of afraid to stay in them like it's more for like the people who are like Hotels. super low on their like on the poverty line you ha and then like each different hotel so like there's different like men's hotels there's like your various types of hotels up to like your most glamorous so like the plaza and stuff like that right right um and then you Hotels and then are still terrifying though i will say motel i i still won't stay in a motel they just always all, every single one of them gives me serial killer vibes and i just can't <laughs> i'd rather camp <laughs> yeah we've had a couple of hotels with my mom and i have stayed at that we were like okay don't even get undressed just get in the bed sleep so we can get in get up early in the morning and drive <laughs> ben and i booked a hotel one time and i won't say which hotel it was but it was a chain hotel and it was so sketchy and i heard people screaming at each other in the middle of the night like through the walls like in the hallway and it was like so sketchy there's water damage on the ceiling they had like a jacuzzi under the water damage and it was like ah mm. yeah <laughs> it's like everything about this feels bad right i barely trust like these in hotels to be decent until i get there <laughs> and see the place myself yeah um but yeah so then you also had the women's hotels which were literally just hotels for women only basically Right, um, which so the, I kind of understand. Yeah. So the first um, was the Martha Washington in 1903, and it was built so that women had somewhere to go no matter what. At the time, if a woman showed up after 6 p.m., she would be turned away mm -hmm. unless she was carrying a large, heavy trunk because hotels were trying not to cater to possible prostitutes. Okay. Um, so then, like, even Where upper Where were they supposed to Go because anywhere like, else basically like after 6 p.m like... after 6 p.m if you just walk in with like your purse or something or like a smaller bag they're like you could be a prostitute it's a it's the time for <laughs> sex workers to so, come out <laughs> so strategy would have been for a sex worker to just have a suitcase with her yeah <laughs> full of anything so, like, even upper-class women admitted to preferring to staying in train stations rather than risking the embarrassment of being turned away just because of the time that they arrived at a hotel, which is how, like, these women's um, hotels really started. Okay. I, but... Like, could you imagine, one like... Is, <laughs> one of those things is significantly safer than the other, though. I have a lot of questions. Like, it's... 
I, I think it, that would be one of those situations where you kind of just got to set your ego aside and just like try. Not at that point. If you're an upper class woman, like your reputation was everything. I mean, fair, because that's like the only thing you were allowed to own for yourself. And even then, mm, but like, mm, yeah, I don't know. I don't know about that. That seems that seems like a sketchy decision. I don't Yeah. Mm. So what the Barbizon had that the rest of the women's hotels didn't was their clientele. Okay. The other hotels all cater towards the working woman or your upper, like already upper class woman. Sure. So okay. these, like the working women were basically the ones who came to the city because they wanted secretarial jobs, etc. Right. Those who went to the Barbizon were the ones who secretly, or not so secretly, wanted to be artists of some kind. It right. catered to dreams of glitz, glamour, and ambition. Nice. So, like, there's, there, so, like, there are stories of people where, like, their families had no idea that they wanted to be, like, an artist of some kind because it was just, like so taboo for the family so then they would go to new york saying we're going to get the secretarial job and then they'd go to the barbizon because that's where they could further their possible careers in artistry and stuff like that once they were there would they then tell their family or was it still like a hush hush secret unless they like unless you actually make it you wouldn't tell your family at that point if you actually made it then yeah you could to tell your family yeah so Rates at the Barbizon started at $10 a week, which in today's currency would be about $170 a week in U.S. dollars. Not bad at all when we look at our rental rates now. $170 a week. Yeah. In today's money. Yeah. That is nothing. (laughs) That is, like, nothing at all. That's amazing. But was it, like, but that's, like, a a decent chunk of money back then, though. Yeah, back then is a... But it's better than some of the other hotels, like, it's, and it's better than rental, like, like if you're trying to do a rental or anything like that, like, like a whole apartment. yeah, it still was, like, a little bit better, mm-hmm. but, yeah, like, it's still a fairly decent chunk of money. But they also, okay, so they don't have a kitchen, so are they paying for their own groceries? So you'd be, they, so like... you'd be paying, so you'd be paying to get your food, so, like, they would have, like, the hotel kitchen, so you okay. could be getting like room service. You could get you could go down to like the dining rooms and stuff like that, right? Or gotcha. you could go out okay. to eat. So you're then adding on like your food costs and stuff like that. Gotcha, gotcha. Okay. Yeah. I was wondering if that was like a provided like complimentary service. Or... No, and then like some people would have be caught with hot plates in their rooms and. The hot plates would have to be taken away because it's against the fire regulations, the basically. Fire regulations. Yeah, <laughs> right. But people that would like try to take dangerous. in hot plates, and then like, in order to save a couple bucks. Uh, yeah, I mean that sucks. I I definitely understand trying to sneak a hot plate in your room because I feel like I absolutely would have. <laughs> but just because, just because, like these are all women with that independent urge. They don't want to be relying on other people. Well, therefore. Some of them did enjoy it. Like, like a lot of them did enjoy it, though, because it was also, like, you had your own chef. You had your own maid. True. Right? Like, you weren't having to do this work yourself. That's true. That's it was fair. more the financial of it that yeah, they were, like... saving the money. And so, right, they were, like, okay, can we cut a couple corners here so then we can go out partying that instead of having to pay for the food at the hotel? That's fair. That makes sense. Yeah. I, I, I stand by that. So, other than, like, the studios and stuff that I talked about a bit earlier, there were also meeting rooms for lectures, spaces for performances that could seat about 300 people, a gym and a full-sized swimming pool, just to name a few of the amenities um, available to residents. Right. Um, the swimming pool in the basement. Yeah. So, a New York Times article actually advertised this. At all hours of the day, the laughter of girls can be heard intermingling with the rhythmic thud of the balls in the squash courts and the splashing of water in the pool. Modern Amazons in the making are learning to fence. Swimmers of the future are being taught the crawl in the nether regions of the Barbizon. The nether regions. Yeah. (laughs) That's such a funny way of phrasing it. 
Like instead of saying the basement, it's awesome. just the nether regions. It's a little bit sexier awesome. than the basement. <laughs> the nether regions. Also calling a whole hotel of adult women girls is like the very early 1900s. Yeah. <laughs> So, unfortunately, our friend Margaret did pass away in her room at the Barbizon in 1932, just a year after she moved in. She had a brain tumor that kept growing during her stay, where she'd excuse herself for days at a time to nurse headaches before rejoining the rest of the women staying at the hotel for tea. Mm. But she was far from the last famous figure to grace the halls of the Barbizon Hotel for Women. For podcast timing's sake, I'm going to fast forward to 1944 in order to touch upon Betsy Talbert Blackwell, editor-in-chief of Mademoiselle magazine. Oh, okay. Betsy had a very close relationship with the Barbizon, as I kind of mentioned earlier. Because of her contest to find new female editors that she could help shape careers out of, many fame, many to be famous writers descended upon the hotel for month long stays each. Two such writers are Joan Didion and Sylvia Plath. And we're going to talk okay. about them in just like a little bit. So the reputation of the Barbizon spread worldwide, and the staff started to have trouble keeping up with all the requests for rooms. It's estimated that at a time in the 1950s, over a hundred famous people were staying there alongside the many other girls who were trying to shoot their shots. Right, okay. S soon, people were refusing to allow their daughters to go to New York unless they could stay at the Barbizon. Judy Garland oh, famously okay. annoyed the heck out of staff when she insisted that her daughter, Liza Minnelli, stay there. Judy would phone every three hours to check in on Liza, getting word if she wasn't in her room and would not get off the phone until her daughter was tracked down by staff so she could hear Liza's voice to know that everything was okay. Wow, that's a little helicoptery. That's pretty intense. I think, though, that, like, and knowing Judy Garland's history, she had anxiety and stuff like that. So, I mean, like, Liza was kind of her be-all and end-all at that point. Yeah, like, but mm, I know this is a modern perspective, but like as a parent, it is your responsibility to like take care of your own mental so that you can take care of your kids, you know? So yeah, but I know that's a modern perspective and I know that wasn't like a yeah. thing that people knew about or talked about at that point. So I could just see the staff going, oh dear Lord, it's Judy again. Okay, but where's Liza? <laughs> Give this girl a break. <laughs> like, basically, I could see them be, like, like, like watching the clock going, okay, Judy's about to call. Where is Liza? <laughs> oh, there's the time. I would hope that Liza would get used to it as well and try to make it easier on staff, too. But Yeah. Yeah. So, post-war is when the Barbizon got its nickname as the Dollhouse. Everyone knew that the women who entered there would leave a very well-shaped and ready-to-take society by storm. Men flocked to the lobby and cafe in hopes of picking up a Barbizon girl for themselves. Bro. It's trying to just skip doing the work but getting getting all the credit. Like, please. <laughs> so I see you. I see what you're doing. J.D. Salinger is one of the most famous men who would be found in the cafe pretty much daily in hopes of finding the right woman after his previous wife left him for Charlie Chaplin. Dude. Come on. <laughs> I just love him, like, yeah, oh my god, I'm like, his wife left him for Charlie Chaplin? First of all, hilarious. <laughs> like, that well, just, and that just the, goes to show that funny guys pull, but so also. The <laughs> author that, um, the author of the book that I was reading for, like, some of my research on this, she even said that his, that Charlie Chaplin was funny, J.D. Salinger was not. <laughs> This is what I mean. Funny guys make good husbands. That's like, you know, that's just common knowledge at this point, or it should be. But even <laughs> funnier is that he usually didn't even introduce himself as himself. Instead, he would tell the girls that he was a goalie for the Montreal Canadiens because they found that even hotter than a writer. <laughs> oh, please. Oh, my gosh. Okay, so. <laughs> All right. So not only are you hanging around this hotel trying to gain notoriety by dating one of the women who lives there, 
but also you're going to lie yeah. to get into that relationship. Well, and like girls would come back up and be like, "Oh, I just had this lovely date with the with this man that I met in the cafe, and he's a goalie for the Montreal Canadiens." And then and the other girls would be like, "Oh, I've had a date with the same guy." He's like, "Oh yeah, he was a very nice guy. Like he was such a sweet guy down there, isn't he?" Like, oh my gosh, was he like an established author already at this point, or like? I'm not sure if he was like established. Established, he might have been. He might have had like a couple of his novels out, but yeah. <laughs> gotcha, okay. I just find it hilarious that he was like, oh yeah, I'm a Canadian. <laughs> <laughs> a Canadian goalie. For the you Montreal Canadiens. <laughs> For the Montreal Canadiens. You know who gets hit in the face a bunch? Goalies? Hockeys? Yeah. So Especially at that point. Have they invented the hockey mask yet? I think so. I, th I think it was. I think it was, I think it was like still in that rudimentary. Um, for the yeah, goalie that first mask, it looked like a um. Like the little, like, like Jason was coming after you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, pretty much. So Carolyn Schaffner, she went to the Barbizon in 1947 at the age of 19 to escape her role as a housewife and found a modeling job within a week when a photographer spotted her in the hotel. Touring back to the hockey mask thing for a second, I just I checked and it's it wasn't invented until 1959, so like, so kind of he's around the same ish time, then probably. Okay. okay, so there's less of a possibility that he got smacked in the face a bunch. Okay, possible, <laughs> yes. I just I feel like you would be able to tell if someone at that point was an established goalie for any Canadian team because their face would be broken. Um, like I don't know. Sorry. Anyway, enough <laughs> about hockey masks. Back to your story. Um, so yeah, so Carolyn then met her neighbor, mm -hmm. another young woman who had hopes of becoming something more by attending one of the acting schools in town. Okay. That neighbor and soon to be best friend was none other than Grace Kelly. Okay. Grace is another person that we're going to do a full episode on because her life is just fascinating in its own right. But for the purposes of this episode, I will reveal that Grace's stay at the Barbizon was paid for by her parents. At, you know, I would expect no less at this point. It sounds like it's become a pretty classy joint with a pretty good reputation. Well... So her parent, like, so one of the things with her parents paying for it was that they were constantly, like, in her face and trying, and basically being like, you should just come back home, like, this isn't going to go anywhere, like, you, like, is it right? So but, like, we'll pay for you, but if you can't get this done within this amount of time, you have to come home, we're going to stop paying, that kind of a thing. I mean, that could be fair. Yeah. But she found herself getting quite jealous of her friends who got their independence and were able to pay for their own lives, even when it meant spending hours at their desks looking at ways to cut costs so that their money could go as far as possible in an increasingly expensive world. That's also fair. That also makes sense. But I mean, she ended up going from Barbizon resident to Academy Award winning actress to Princess of Monaco within like a few short years. <laughs> Yeah, that's true. That's that's pretty wild. <laughs> like, pretty she didn't dramatic, need to you know. <laughs> be worried about anything. Like, <laughs> Yeah, no, like, she's fine. <laughs> so, if any of our listeners have read The Bell Jar by Sylvia Plath, then you technically know a lot about the Barbizon Hotel. The classic novel is entirely based on her time at the hotel, peeling back the curtain to show the drama that would happen behind the glittery facade, much like how Truman Capote did in his stories. So right. okay. she literally changed the name of the hotel, and she changed the name of some of the people that she was talking about, but everything else in that book is pretty much accurate to what happened when she was there. Oh my gosh, okay. Okay. Um, so Sylvia arrived at the Barbizon along with the rest of the batch of guest editors for Mademoiselle, like, for that month, and she was immediately aware that she was the top of the heap. She spent most of her time judging the other girls, not bothering to hide her disdain for their small-town ways. It, it was even at the point where <laughs> they would be split off to do, like, different things and be mentored by different people, and so the... 
editor that we talked about um, just like a little bit ago, um, Betsy Talbot and stuff, and another editor took just Sylvia out for dinner and literally just had chit chat the entire time where everybody else had to go do work and like okay. we're being like tr- like where they're like oh yeah you don't need to do any work with you you're perfectly fine and like <laughs> we're just gonna sit here and have a fancy dinner and chit chat where everybody else goes and actually has to like learn stuff <laughs> so like she was given like sure. the treatment preferential treatment yeah yeah fair enough so, but her stay at the Barbizon and the internship at Mademoiselle magazine wasn't smooth sailing, as one can see in a read through of the Bell Jar. Mm. Um, like there were points where the girls would be off crying in the bathrooms, and then the people and then the editors and stuff um, would be like, "Well, we didn't bring out like crybabies, basically. Like if you Tough can't enough. take if you can't yeah. take the um, criticism, then you're not going to hack it." <laughs> Yeah, and Zimmer was like, get out of the kitchen kind of thing. Yeah. Two weeks, though, after returning home, Sylvia's mother noticed some unhealed scars when Sylvia came down without, like, where her legs were kind of bare from, like, the, like with, like, her skirt. And when confronted about her self-harm, Sylvia responded with the fact that she hoped that both herself and her mother would die right there because the world was so horrible she admit she was admitted to a psychiatric hospital very soon afterwards and put through electroshock therapy, something that she wrote about in fear of a lot before leaving New York when she witnessed an electric chair execution as part of her job. Oh man, that's really rough. Part of the Barbizon's hotel, like history is unfortunately tied into Sylvia Plath and the other editors' time times at the famous building. All of these women had so much pressure put on them by the world, the hotel management, and the magazine that sponsored their training in their month-long stays. Sadly, the pressure got to Sylvia the most, with her first suicide attempt being just after her arrival home, and ultimately ending her own life after multiple attempts. Many of the other girls worried about their own mental health problems, with one of them admitting that Sylvia was the one who kept them alive because they didn't want to be remembered as quote-unquote, the other one who killed herself. Oh, I mean, if it keeps you going, it keeps you going, but that's a tough perspective. Like, it's just like a total insight to the pressures put on a woman at the time. Yeah. Well, and it kind of, like, makes sense that it would grow into this sort of monster because this hotel its entire fame is based on the success of the women who live there yeah. after having lived there. So it makes sense that that's the way that the cycle is going to go, that it's going to end up pressuring these women into doing better and better and better constantly all the time. Every single one of them has to succeed because the name of the hotel is at stake. Yeah. Like, but that's just... Well, and then, like, the... The relationship between the hotel and this magazine didn't help things at all either because, like, the magazine was just as bad where, like, the editors of the magazine did nothing to help these girls, even keeping a wide berth of one of them because she was on the verge of a mental breakdown after her father died rather than trying to find, like, a way to assist her through the trauma. It was like, oh, you're on the verge of a mental breakdown, therefore we're just going to avoid you. Like, you're here for the month because you're already here. But we're just going to avoid you and you just go deal with your own shit and hopefully nothing bad happens. That's so awful. Like, That's so awful. If you want people to succeed, you have to support them up. You can't just, like, yell at them to succeed and then expect that to work. Yeah, like, it's just a pure lens into that time and, like, the mental health lack of assistance. Right. Especially for women. Yeah, no kidding. Um, so yeah, but the 1960s saw the start of the hotel's ultimate demise as a women's hotel. Ironically, it was the women's movement that brought it down. Women were noticing a fine line between independence away from men and being hidden away from the world's gender realities. Yeah. At first, it was a safe place for women as they grappled with the circulating ideas that men were blameless in sex and the restrictions on getting access to the new birth control pills. Mm. But soon, it needed to be something more, and it just couldn't keep up. 
Women still flocked to the hotel um, as Judy's younger daughter, Lorna Luft, went to stay at the Barbizon before getting her first Broadway role in Lolita. But the hotel right. itself was going through a transformation with the rest of society. Those of you who are also going to be listening to our sister podcast, Meet Us at the Drive-In, will recognize Lorna Luft's name as she played Paulette in Grease 2, which we talked about in our, in our first episode. Right, yeah. Yeah. I thought that was hilarious. As I'm, as I'm like, hang on, wait, there's a connection. <laughs> wait a second. Yeah. Interesting. Okay. There really were, like, a decent amount of, like, big names on Grease, too, weren't there? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Fascinating. That's so wild to think about. It's so weird sometimes the movies that you see that have, like, all these big name people, and then the movie gets, like, no attention, and it's like, what? How did this happen? <laughs> right. Crazy. So what the Barbizon had to change by the end of the 1960s was the idea that their clientele were a specific gender. This is the okay. age of women fighting for gender equality, so staying at a woman's only hotel was no longer the quote-unquote cool thing to do. It took right, a while okay. for the hotel to change, though, claiming that the ban on men was needed to keep the sanctuary that it was known for. I but... mean, I can kind of understand that to an extent for the culture at the time, the way that they saw things, the way that they saw women as being like, like, e like even after a woman gained independence, she was still like a fragile little thing that needed to be protected, right? Yeah. So like... I can kind of see the mentality for the time, but yeah, maybe just hold the men to higher stuff, like let the men in, but then just hold them to the same standards that you put the women. Yeah. Like well, that doesn't <clears throat> seem that ludicrous. Well, the clientele numbers continue to drop as women mm -hmm. either didn't want to stay there or because they couldn't afford it during the recession of 1969 to 1970. The that nail in the sense. coffin, though, for people coming to stay at the hotel at that point was the 1975 murder of Ruth Harding. Oof. Ruth was known to chat with anyone in the lobby and was found dead in her 11th floor room, strangled to death with her murder unsolved to this very day. Okay, so questions. How did that, like, okay. So, 11th floor, no suspects? I, I, I think there were suspects, but, like, none of them, like, worked. And Ruth was known, like, where basically I think a lot of the girls were, like, she was kind of known just to talk to, like, anybody in the lobby. So anybody could have been the one that she led up to the, like, so that she somehow got up and led up to the room. Because, like, at then, this I point, think like, at this point, like, the restrictions might have been getting a little lax. Mm, right. Right? Because our f original, man like, assistant manager is no longer going to be there. It's, right, okay. It's right, like, she would have been, like, long retired, possibly even passed away. So people are allowed to bring, like, friends up and stuff now? And might, I don't know if they would have been allowed to bring friends up, but they might have been able easier. to sneak them up better, like, easier. I just imagine this poor lady, like, inviting some, like, some person that she just met up for tea because, like, just out of the goodness of her heart or something, and, like, oof. Yeah. 11th floor, no signs of breaking and entering? No. So she almost guaranteed let someone in, and then they stabbed her in the back. Well, not stabbed her in the back, but, like, you know, betrayed her. Yeah. Literally strangled her. Yeah. Well, Oof. at this point, New York was kind of changing. Like, the people in New York were becoming, a, like, at the, like, for this point of time, it was becoming a bit more seedier, a bit more criminal. Like, you had mm. more of that underbelly showing up more. It wasn't the, it, it wasn't, like, the full-on glitz and glamour that it used to be. Right. Right? Okay. Um, and so the Barbizon had to follow suit with the changes. In 1981, they opened their doors to men and changed their name later on down the road um, to the Melrose Hotel, as I said earlier. Right. So the group of women who refused to leave continued to live there, uh, getting an entire floor to themselves as they lived under a rent-controlled agreement that couldn't be broken. Uh, okay, yeah, if you have a rent-controlled agreement, you don't leave that, like... <laughs> yeah, and Amazing. so apparently, like, these women would, like, they couldn't let go of, like, 
the old ideas. And so they would come down and try to give like the younger women like their two cents of how they should be, what they should be doing, what they should be wearing and how they should be talking to each other and other people and stuff like that. Right. So they, they're basically kind of like, yeah, yeah. Okay. Goodbye, granny. (laughs) By the end of it. Karen, how about you go back to your hotel room now? Okay. (laughs) Yeah. Um, there were points where the hotel offered them like over a million dollars to leave, but they did I not. But they did not want to leave their youthful glamour years behind. Like oh, they were so just they too attached. And never left. <laughs> yeah, apparently, like their suites and stuff became kind of like hoarder. Like, like you're like you're kind of like your typical grandma suite that was just stuck oh, in no. the past. Even like after, like they so they did like a whole gut and renovation of this building, and the woman came back <laughs> with like to, to have like their. Where they're like, okay, like you're not like, like where they're like, we're not leaving, but we will happily take your renovations. <laughs> Thank you. Oh, you want to give us like our own floor? Great. Is that even like legal at that point? Is Apparently, that, I, mean, I guess they're still paying rent, but like, can the owners like not break the contract? Apparently not, know? because five of them are still living there today. Why? So four. So out of the fourteen of them, five are still alive and still living there. <laughs> and they still are just reliving their glory days. From when they were teenagers in the 60s. Yeah. Honey, time to move on. They ain't moving on until they're in their coffins. I mean, okay, like, like I said before, if you've got a, like, price locked rental agreement, especially in New York City, it's expensive there. Like, I get it. You keep the cheap rent, for sure. Like, I, like, you know, life is tough. Life is expensive. I understand that. But at the same time, the reason that they're doing it doesn't really sound like it's financially motivated. It sounds like it's just they don't want to let go of the nostalgia of living this place from the sounds of it. Exactly. Pretty much. And in that case, I say, okay, no, wait. (laughs) Yeah. I don't know about that, especially if you're trying to my I wouldn't have a problem with it if they weren't trying to push it on everyone else living at the hotel. Yeah. I think that's the that's the sticking point. Yeah. Oh, for sure. Um, but yeah, so I only touched upon like a few of the famous figures who have stayed at this location throughout the years. But there have been so many. So a few that people might recognize by name are Lauren Bacall, Joan Crawford, Nancy Reagan, Rita Hayworth, Cloris Leachman, and Frida Kahlo. Interesting. Okay. Yeah. Well, they had some, like, big-name people. Oh, yeah. And all of them were, like, artists or revolutionaries or... Yeah. Um, Some of the more modern famous people who are male and noteworthy um, include Ricky Gervais, as I mentioned earlier, who has a current apartment in the building, and Boris Johnson. Seriously? Yeah. So I think Boris probably lived there when he was younger or has like a suite as a secondary home because he's actually okay. USA born to British parents. Is he really? Yeah, he was born um, uh, here in North America. He wasn't born in Britain, but his parents are British. So he could listen, go oh, and become an asshole that does too. Explain a lot. <laughs> <laughs> that, that, that does explain some, I'm not going to lie. I don't want to get too into it, but... That explains his uh, Trump tendencies. <laughs> I think some of them don't make a few things make sense. That's all I was going to say. <laughs> yeah. Um, but like from like what I can see, his main residence um, actually looks to be possibly a 1.3 million pound buy-to-let townhouse in South London that he bought in 2019. Townhouse? Yeah. He's like a major politician. I don't know why, but I never I think, expect them to live in townhouses. I think, though, that, like, in Britain, a lot of places are, like, flats, townhouses, semi-detached. Like, I mean, okay, that's fair. That's right. So, especially in, like, your smaller. southern, Lon- like, you're near, like, London area. That that does make sense. I expect um, them, like, a full, like, full-story condo kind of thing. But, like, Yeah. Yeah, for more privacy, yeah, you probably true, would though. do a townhouse. It'd probably be even easier to um, do security for a townhouse, depending on how they that's do true. their security for the British politicians. 
That's true. That makes sense. It is a much smaller country and it is a lot more like densely populated. So that, that, that makes sense. Yeah. But yeah. Yeah. So that's kind of like Boris Johnson was, (laughs) I think Boris Johnson was the one that surprised me the most. (laughs) Just like the random, just like, wait, what? (laughs) Oh, how far you've fallen. (laughs) Oh man. That's wild. I'm surprised that, like, Taylor Swift doesn't have, like, a condo or something there just to have, like... (laughs) At this point, it's not even a flex. It's just money from the sounds of it. It doesn't sound like it has much to do with, like, a career anymore. No, I think it's just more of a place to live. Like, and I think it's fairly nicely well, like, it's nicely done and stuff, right? So it's a bit more of, like, a glamorous... Right, so like I apartment. Think, uh, all of, yeah. So I think in Taylor Swift's case, all of her awards sitting on a shelf in her multi-million dollar mansion is probably a flex enough. I don't think she needs a hotel room. <laughs> yeah, but like, think of the songs that could come out of what she finds out about people from the Barbizon, oh, compared to like sure. the one song about the hill, like the one okay, house. But, like, I mean, she could still write about the hotel, to be honest. Like, to be fair. Yeah, but she's not going to have that same muse, I don't think, if she's not yeah. already living there. Like, I think that's why she no. wrote about that house, is because she was living in the place of the history that just was on her mind. That's true. She very much does need a personal connection to her work. Um, yeah. From, you know, an observer's standpoint, at least. Who knows how she actually feels about it, but, yeah. Most everything she writes is very personal, so... Yeah. Or but, comes across as very personal anyway. Yeah. But yeah, I now just want a Taylor Swift album all about people from the Barbies. The drama of the hotel. Oh, man. Can like... you imagine her doing like a reputation style album, but just about oh. like banter and like drama from this one woman's hotel? Yes, that'd be amazing. Oh, God, it'd be so funny. It'd be so good. Taylor Swift, if you happen to be listening to this right now and you steal my idea, I do want like a a half percent of the income that you make on that. That's it. That's all I ask. That'll be enough. That'll that'll set me for life. (laughs) Yeah. But yeah, for anybody who wants to read any more fiction that's set at the Barbizon, um, a book that would be interesting for you guys is The Dollhouse by Fiona Davis. She writes like a lot of um, historical fan, like um, historical fiction and so, yeah, that book is set in the 1950s at the Barbizon Hotel. There's a play called The Dollhouse. Is that the same or is that a different No, that's Dollhouse. Henrik Ibsen, honey. That's, like, long okay. before the hotel was even... I have to check it because I know that I've read a script of a play that was called The Dollhouse, and I just never know if it's the same dollhouse or if, or if it's a different dollhouse. No, no, no. And then no. when you brought up this one, I was like, oh, maybe it is a different one. Uh, hang on. I'm just going to check and see. Doll's House, Ibsen. Bum, bum, bum. So that when one's about like, the published? wife with her kids. And the husband is super controlling. And she lets it happen <clears throat> at first. And then eventually wants to leave. And then leaves her kids behind by the end of it. Because she doesn't want to be a doll anymore. She wants to be a whole person. Yeah. Uh, it was... It was first put on in 1879. Okay. <laughs> so yeah, no. Listen, I just read but it that in might high be how they. That might be one of the ways that they got the name of, like the nickname, the Dollhouse for it, is because it's very much of a feminist independence hotel. There's a bunch of dolls and they're all in the same house. Let's call it the Dollhouse. Yeah, I could see some like 1920s like schmoozy business dude coming up with something like that. Oh, most likely. Mm-hmm. No guys allowed, just dolls. <laughs> yeah, pretty much. Mm-hmm. <laughs> but yeah. Interesting. So that's the Barbizon Hotel. Yeah, I think I heard about the murder. Um, I, I was going to say, that might be what you heard thing. about on My Favorite Murder. I don't even know if it, I don't even know if it was. If it, NFL, was, but it was, but like that's what would be most likely talked about on the podcast if it was talked about. <laughs> If it was MFM, that would have been the, uh, that would have been why. Murder, I'm going to check. I'm going to search their episodes. Because I think they have that set up. So for their episodes, you can do a search. 
Oh, maybe not. Do I have to scroll through individually? Because that is not that's happen. not happening for a while. Oh, wait, I'll do a page search. Hang on. How do you spell this place again? B A. Yeah. R B I Z O N. Yeah, Gray's not found. Nope, wasn't M F M. Don't know what it was. <laughs> <laughs> I have no idea. There's plenty of YouTubers and people that I listen to that talk about true crime, so. It could have been any of them. Yeah, it's a very big possibility. Yeah. Famous hotel and someone died there, so someone talked about it. So Someone talked about it at some point. Oh, probably. No? Oh. But, I mean, you just hit the head on the nail as to next week's episode. We will be talking about a murder. <laughs> Fun stuff. Is it a murder from the Victorian era? Is that what you and Vaxi decided on stream? Yes. Nice. Solid. I just won't tell you what murder yet. It's Victorian era. There's a lot. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> so nobody could catch anybody. Nobody had DNA. No, they caught, Ooh. I think they caught somebody for this one, but. Oh yeah, it's not unsolved? No. Well, I mean, it's oh. possibly so I know unsolved. it's not Jack the Ripper. It's possibly unsolved, though. Possibly unsolved. Yeah. They possibly got the wrong guy? Possibly. We'll learn more about this next week. I'll stop spoiling it now. (laughs) (laughs) Yep, we will see you guys all then.